Good morning, everyone. My name is Larry Sashin. I am senior partner and founder of L. Sashin & Associates, a boutique uh, consulting firm that deals with small to medium-sized businesses. Uh, today, we're going to be speaking about cybersecurity for the next normal. Um, all you have to be is awake to see that hacking and cybersecurity are becoming a an everyday occurrence in our business and, and personal lives. Uh, first, we used to hear that our credit cards have been stolen from department stores, that some idiot brought home 52,000 names on their laptop and then went and left their laptop on the table at the restaurant. Well, it's become a lot more sophisticated. I, I think in early June, uh, both a large, uh, oil refinery and a meat processor were uh, were both hacked so we were out of gasoline and hot dogs uh, it is becoming an everyday occurrence so what happens if this happens to you and your small to medium sized business can you pay the hackers to get your uh, your systems unlocked can you can you survive going back to the stone age when everything was written on paper and dealing without a lot of things that you used to and and, and can you survive losing the confidence of your your customers um it's a problem so um mark why don't we start with you sure. and, and um Hold on, would you let Will in please, Bob? Uh, why don't you start and um, talk about the the legal ramifications. What what goes on after a, a business is hacked? Sure, so, so um, thanks for having me, Larry. Really appreciate uh, the opportunity. Um, you know, I, I think this is a really important conversation for what we call middle America, right? Um, Oftentimes they'll say, you know, we don't have the kind of information that hackers want or why are they targeting us? And, you know, um, what we've really seen is effectively now in 2021, you don't need to click on anything. You don't need to have the email sent to you. You could be using a product that could have a vulnerability that could be exploited at this point. So, you know, when we would have had this conversation a year ago, I would have said, hey, listen, you know, be careful with your clicking on, make sure employee training. But we've actually done that to the point now where we think things like, MFA are very important, but we realize that it's not the end all be all. And I'm sure uh, um, um, you know, my, my colleague will be speaking later on about things like EDR and MDR, and really the carriers now starting to uh, have a greater appreciation for additional, uh, um, I say risk prevention tools, but effectively what we've appreciated is the fact that we can't prevent it, but we need to be able to respond better to it when there's an actual event. Um, so, so I think that's a, a bit of a change within the carrier mindset. Um, what's been going on over the past year, right? So we've been out of the office now for 16, 17 months at this point. Uh, my personal opinion, not Marsh's uh, uh, opinion, um, I think the pandemic had done more for uh, small to medium-sized businesses to appreciate the risk that they have with respect to cyber risk uh, than any breach to date. And again, I don't have any data that backs that up. That's just for my own personal conversations that I'm having with insureds on a daily basis. Um, why? They feel susceptible now. Um, one of the things they feel susceptible to is ransomware. Um, and what we've seen is the ransomware demands actually surge over the pandemic. Um, we saw it get all the way up to about $233,000 per an average demand. Now, again, if we would have had this conversation two, three years ago, we would have been talking about five or $10,000 in Bitcoin. Now you're talking about you know, 20 times that, um, and that's the average demand. I mean, I, I had a client, um, again, granted it's a little bit bigger than a small business, but I mean, as um, about a $200 million textile manufacturer, hackers uh, went after this particular client. It was the US subsidiary of a larger, probably $3 billion conglomerate. They thought they got into the conglomerate. Uh, they started negotiating with our forensics team and the, the, they're asking for $6 million from the forensics team. And, you know, very early on, they said, guys, you know, you got the wrong target. You know, you don't, you're, not, you, you're not aware who you actually hit. And we were able to get that demand actually down from about $6 million down to about 
uh, 800,000. So why do I bring this up? Um, business interruption is one of the most important things really in this conversation, I think, anecdotally. Whether we're talking about what technology deployed or the ramifications uh, from a legal perspective, we really need to start to appreciate the loss of revenue that businesses are not able to collect should they be going through one of these events. And now the carriers were seeing, well, you know, the insurance companies are to blame for all these ransomware um, um, uh, uh, payments or the, uh, the, 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 the continuation or facilitation of this, um, of this crime. And effectively, the insurance companies are looking at it and they're trying to figure out how do we get off this claim at the lowest possible cost? And if that's going to be to pay the, the demand and perhaps then work off of the encryption key to try and get things back up and to normal versus you know building everything from backups and that's gonna take us another three weeks and we may be down for an additional three weeks. Well, the insurance company is gonna say, well, that's another three weeks of lost revenue and it becomes very much a business decision. And I think that's what we're losing in the news is really the business decision that needs to happen when these events are happening. And I, I, I encourage everybody on today's call, if you get anything out of it, is really start to think about what can I be doing to be more proactive? You don't have to spend a tremendous amount of money to become a, cyber, a better cyber risk. You can do things like Patch Tuesday. You can do things like a, a free vulnerability scan, um, talking to legal counsel, making sure you have an incident response plan and, and maybe trying it out actually, right? I mean, you know, it's the same thing as like a fire right. drill. You know, it's, right. it's great to have the piece of paper, but if you don't, you know, practice it, what's the point of, uh, of, of having it? Thank you, Mark. You know, I'm so excited about this panel. This is such a right. great panel. I'm so excited about him, I forgot to introduce him. <laughs> <laughs> so, George, why don't you start? Let's sure. go around the horn and um, tell everybody who everybody is here. Sure. Uh, I'm George Adam. I'm, I'm the president of Value Technology. We're uh, 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 what's called the IT service uh, managed service provider. So we do end-to-end uh, -end support for uh, small and medium businesses, uh, which includes uh, quite a bit of cybersecurity for our clients, as, as you know, as any kind of responsible uh, IT professional. Um, and that's become quite a bit of what we've done in the past three years, uh, and particularly in the last 16 months with with the pandemic, kind of. Uh, almost like rocket fueling the both the level of attacks and the uh, the amount of uh, concern that the SMB uh, community has, and they, which is justified. They should be definitely afraid. And I have a bunch on that. Mark, you some really great points there, and I'm gonna I'm gonna Larry keep moving around. So okay, thanks, Alan. My name is uh, Alan Shaya. I'm a chef by trade and um, founder of Pomegranate Hospitality, where uh, we manage three restaurants and a bar. Uh, we have a restaurant in New Orleans called Saba, restaurant in Denver called Safta. Uh, and then we also are just now in the middle of opening a restaurant called Miss River, which is a, a grand Louisiana dining experience, which will be at the Four Seasons in New Orleans, and we'll be operating the Chandelier Bar uh at the four seasons as well thank you a lot uh fred i'm fred clashman i'm the publisher of total food service co-host of today's event uh we've been covering the restaurant food service industry for the last 31 years and thank, thank you. you very much for the opportunity all right mark mark yes why don't you tell people who you are? You spoke so oh. eloquently before. Uh, oh, I, I am, of course. Um, <laughs> Mark Shine, uh, National Co-Chair of the Cyber Center of Excellent Marshall McLennan Agency. We are the world's largest insurance broker. Um, I've sat on the board of the Ponham Institute now for about 10 years, which is the leading organization in cyber statistics. Uh, so I look at this much more from a financial perspective, whereas my colleague, um, um, Greg, is going to be looking at more from a, an IT-centric perspective. George. Yep. George. Yep. George. Um, Will. Sorry. Hey, I'm Will Pierce, uh, one of the owners of Field Trip uh, in New York. We have three locations. I also oversee the hotel division of Ring on Hook uh, with 22 hotel properties spread throughout the U.S. Thank you, Will. Uh, Bob. Bob, me? Yeah, you, you, Bob. 
<laughs> I thought I went there already. Uh, Bob Heiss, uh, Larry's uh, partner in this endeavor. Uh, no real connection to the uh, to the food industry until we started doing these things, but uh, certainly strong business background and uh, out of necessity for the past, uh, well, the, the history we all have um, in secure in uh, cybersecurity in terms of being of needing it and uh, more and more. Uh, it, on a uh, regular basis as, as uh, things develop. Thank you, Bob. And I'm Larry Sashin, the person who forgot to introduce everybody at the beginning of the show. So uh, let's move on. Uh, George. Yes. Uh, you, you know, we, we meet twice a month mm -hmm. in different groups and you talk about the, the clients, the panic that sets into people when all of a sudden everything they depended on doesn't work. Right, right. Why it's, don't you uh, illustrate that? Sure, I can walk you through a little bit of it, uh, <laughs> take, take on a story. I'm sure Mark could tell you a hundred times uh, these, I'm sure he gets these. Uh, so imagine if uh, you come to work on uh, Monday morning and, uh, and you try to log into the system you require, be it a spreadsheet, be it a uh, point of sale system, whatever it may be. And all of a sudden, you find a small text file that says, congratulations, you've been hacked or you've been ransomware by an attack group, a bad actor. Uh, this is the uh, contact for uh, how to give us Bitcoins to get the, the decryption key. And now, literally, what was going to be a very normal week of you know your normal business, all your plans, that everything you did is now utterly disrupted. Like you're, All you'll be doing for the next three to six weeks will be basically undoing the damage done from this attack. And the ramifications are not just the business interruption, uh, which is probably the largest one, honestly, um, if you can, if, if there is good backups and you have some things in place, but really it's, it's, there's so many different pieces of it. I mean, not only do you, uh, I think one of the things that people tend to overlook is that you have a, a legal responsibility to your employees because a lot of times in the attack, they're looking for the uh, HR data from your employees, be it uh, social security numbers, uh, you know, credit, any kind of personal information, because now you're responsible for that as well. And here in New York, there's a laws that uh, are called the New York Shield Act, that now if, if you have a sufficient number of employees, you have to report that to the attorney general. So there's that. Um, which is one part of your mind, which is probably what you're not thinking of, but really you can't even open your business. Uh, we worked with one client that had a that had an incident, and you know we're still unpacking it. Uh, they luckily they had uh, decent backups. Th their demand, their ransom, their initial ransom demand was five million dollars, which they didn't have, obviously, for the size their business was. And um, but they almost lost ten. They almost lost um, you know 10, 10 years of design data, that was a, a critical of their intellectual property in their history. Uh, luckily, it was backed up and we were able to, it was able to be recovered. But um, there's so many pieces of it. Now, all of a sudden, you have to like say every single system in, the, in that network is suspect and needs to be either cleaned for, by, a, by a professional or needs to be completely wiped and rebuilt. Um, the amount of time and effort and energy that takes could be, as I said, six, three to six weeks, depending on the size of your business. And you, know, you can't really even open. You can't really even open for business during that time. So now you, and not only are you like racing to recover, trying to find someone to help you with this recovery. If you don't have a good provider or you don't have a good relationship with someone, um, you're also just not taking any revenue. So you're kind of getting a double whammy of, of, of you're spending a ton of money. And also, also with the insurance, um, depending on what you have in place and how you did your, uh, how you did your forms. And I don't know, Marcus sees as well. Sometimes people are not completely uh, upfront about what they have in place in an insurance form. They may have issues with getting their claim paid for. Uh, I know I'm sure with, with Mark and his team, they're kind of vetting all that, but there's not there's a lot of different brokers out there. So I would highly recommend working with a reputable broker to help you with that. But this, once again, it's a very much a business decision, not a technology decision. Technology only comes into it as part of it. Um, and I think that uh, you know I, I hate the, the old saw of an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure, but in this case, it truly is. Things you do up front now. Or have, are amplified down the road significantly. So okay. thank you, thank you, Alan. Uh, you're in the pits. You're in the real world. <laughs> Wake yeah. up, go to work. You're doing your stuff. You turn on your system, and bango, it's gone. What's next? 
Well, you know, I, um, it, it's not something that as a small business owner that I've really, I think, comprehended the, the, um, the risk. I mean, we work so hard to not have everything um, on a hard drive and to have everything on a cloud or through our um, partners, whether we, you know, we work with Toast as our POS system, and that is going to have all of our um, client information, credit card information, um, all of our uh, information about our, you know, menu and uh, how to order food, whether it's online or even at the restaurant. Um, we've worked really hard on getting all of our recipes out of a um, Excel spreadsheet and into a um, software program called Margin Edge. Uh, and all of that lives on the cloud. Uh, our reservation. One, one second. Let me just break in there. So if it's on the cloud, if it's on other people's systems, who owns the information? Well, I, I'm going to. Let's interrupt you on that one, Larry. You're responsible for it. Ultimately, at the end of the day, any data you have is your responsibility. There's a mo the model is called shared responsibility. So while the provider is responsible for keeping the system up and running and some level of redundancy and backup, at the end of the day, it's your data and it's your company. So you have an obligation to yourself and to your to your you know to your company to sure. store the, 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 the back that up into another place or work with having multiple redundancies because if 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 you know a lot, I, I work with this all the time because well it's in the cloud it's perfectly safe it's in Google it's perfectly safe um, that's not necessarily the case because you can, there's a lot of ways that those uh, data can be breached or attacked deleted or um, there's an accident there's, the thing is when you delete things off some of our cloud services they only have a 30 day retention period. And so they say there's an actual deletion or if there's an incident, you may not know that it's been deleted or, or altered. So it's really important to have multiple redundancies in the, in, especially for core, I would say like this, listening to is like, like, the, like the recipes are your intellectual property. That's like such a critical piece that should be lived in like multiple places. So, yeah. And then, and then our reservation system, we, we work right. through Resi, uh, right. with mm -hmm. all of our client information right. and all of our bookings. Um, right our database of um, who our customers are, how many times right. they've been to the restaurant. And, and so we have these things spread out all over the place. And so, uh, you know, I, I worry that, you know, one of those companies gets hacked or someone hacks into our system, figures out our passwords, is able to then access all of the different, um, whether it's over multiple partners that right. they're, than accessing. Um, I am not by any means an IT specialist. I, I have trouble downloading apps onto my iPhone sometimes. Right. But I but I do, um, you know, I have worked really hard with our team to make sure that we have really good systems for our recipes, for our guests, for our schedules, for our clients. Um, but as a small business owner, I really have no idea how all of that works in the background right. and, and how to protect it. And I have no idea um, whether or not that information is protected um, right. or whether or not we are vulnerable um, to some type of hack. And if, and if, if we were hacked, um, I would be, I would have no idea what we would, what they would offer to, I mean, we don't have any money. We're a small restaurant business, right. you know, we great buy. And so uh, we'd be the worst per people to, to hack. Uh, so it's uh, definitely alarming. Um, and the other part of it is also our social media platforms, which, you know, reach so many of our customers and is one of our, is our biggest marketing tool. Um, and, you know, those I know are super vulnerable um to being taken over twitter facebook instagram uh that's how we communicate with our with our teams and or, or with our and, and also our mailing list um there's another you know when we send out an e-blast it goes out to eighty thousand people uh 
And if the wrong information goes out or someone hacks in and does something that is detrimental to our business, that's a huge concern. That's so great. That's, it's, it's, it's scary. Uh, Will, do you have anything to add to that? You know, I think Alan hit the nail on the head as, as entrepreneurs and as people with uh, limited businesses. You know, we, we rely on third parties a lot, right? Margin Edge is a great uh, integrated tool for inventory that works with your point of sale to, to reduce and give you an accurate food cost at the ever, end of every month. You know, we use companies like Resi and Open Table for guest management. And because we're a small business, we use third parties for PCI compliant credit card processing. So, you know, I think, I think there are always vulnerabilities. Like I'll give you an example. Um, a number of years ago, I worked for an organization where the Amazon account had been hacked by somebody. And that I'm sure this is not to the grand scale of somebody going into the, the infrastructure. It's probably somebody who stole a password from somewhere and hacked it. But I mean, you know, it took months to realize that there were thousands of dollars of Amazon items being sent to an address that none of us knew about. And I think that it's, it's, it's the inability to consistently keep the small eye on a particular business that 10 years ago, Alon or myself would be like, you know, they spent 50 cents more on a pound of chicken. What's going on with the business? And as you expand, you get less and less um, micro oversight over an individual segment of your business. And that's really when our vulnerability, I think, starts to increase. Um, but, you know, like to, to what he said, you know, like we, we live our lives on the cloud and in every facet of, of professional endeavor, you know, we, I, I work with either a Google platform or a proprietary online platform. And, you know, if one of those things were to be hacked, that's a lot of information. I think, I think the hard line of it or, or the backup of it is in existence, but there's just a lot of proprietary information which lives online, whether it's email lists or recipes or, you know, perspectives plans for a new business unit and no right. no one can um like you're never gonna i'm not gonna call margin edge and ask them what my hummus recipe was or how you know how i uh make that biscuit that was so delicious again you know like you, there's no one out there that can um provide you with that information if it does get lost uh and then it's up to us and it's been years i mean you're talking of a lifetime of collecting recipes, techniques. We measure everything out to the gram and it's all there. We've worked so hard to get that um, tight. So our consistency is really good. If, if that went down, uh, it would take more than six weeks. It would take years to recover all of that. Um, another lifetime another <laughs> lifetime right listen yeah. what i want to do is bob has his hand raised which means somebody from the audience asked a question bob well actually it was my own question on this one and uh i'm i'm thinking that uh people that that are doing this hacking have uh are driven by two interests. One is uh, valuable, secure information, social security numbers, client database, uh, passwords, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and the second one um, would be, of course, money. And uh, if I'm a small business owner and I'm thinking about security for my small business, whether it's a cafe or a small diner or a uh, pizza place or, or something like that, uh, I'm thinking that I don't really have that much valuable information. I don't really, um, uh, you know, if it is lost, uh, my downtime might be a few days. Uh, and, and I also would be thinking that <clears throat> these hackers are going after what is probably a guaranteed payment from uh, insurance companies. Uh, so, so maybe Mark can, uh, can comment on this, but um, if I'm a small business owner, do I really have to worry? Um, and, and, and particularly, uh, do, do I need to buy insurance? I mean, what, what, is, what is the real threat to, to, uh, to me with my 20 seat uh, restaurant or, or, uh, or small operation? Can I, can I just do one quick chime in before we go to Mark on go that? Um, yeah. As Alan and I both know, and I'm sure he knows this intimately as I do, whenever we sign a third party contract, whether it's a management deal, a license deal, any sort of agreement, I'm sure he's got one with the Four Seasons. I for sure have one with the addition. Um, there's always clauses in there that call out the necessity for cyber for, for cyber insurance. Like that's a very okay. stable thing that, that we see within those contracts. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I was, I, yeah. Sorry, Mark, go ahead. <laughs> 
No, I just, just um, I mean, I think this is all, I think you guys all have the kind of the right idea. Um, the contractual requirements are starting to become uh, more and more prevalent in some of the uh, deals that you guys are trying to get um, on a go forward basis. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's entertaining sometimes to see some of the clauses that are put in. Oftentimes it's outside counsel that might not be a cyber uh, attorney and they're putting in, you know, general liability language asking for you to have, you know, a uh, 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 waiver of, uh, uh, um, uh, waiver of uh, subrogation, primary non-contributory, you know, language that you see on general liability policies, not necessarily cyber insurance policies. Right. So there's definitely an uptick. Um, you know, I, I've heard uh, uh, from Will and Alon, you know, hey, listen, like we're, we're depending on all these third parties, right? I mean, we can't afford to build this stuff in-house. And then, we'll, you know, again, we're going to these contracts. Oftentimes the information is cradle to grave. Um, so if we are the ones providing it to Google or Amazon or uh, ABC cloud provider, and ABC Cloud Provider is compromised, and we're the ones that gave ABC Cloud Provider the information. Chances are, there's indemnification language that we're gonna, you know, they're gonna, we're gonna have to hold uh, them harmless for them leaking the information. Although okay. our systems were never compromised, but yet we signed into an agreement, and then we started to provide them with the information, and then they were compromised, and then our client's information was then out there, uh, uh, you know, in the uh, the metaverse, right? Um, Effectively, it, it's, you know, it becomes a liability. Again, it comes back to the entity. So do small businesses need cyber insurance? You know, again, um, Alan was talking about um, uh, social media and, you know, I think like 80,000 followers or something like that or 80,000 email blasts. Um, we think about it, media liability coverage. What is being said about us out there, both in print and digital? That could be added into a cyber insurance program to date. Uh, media liability coverage is fairly standard, and as long as you're not a you know a publisher or a, a social media company or something like that, where it's your you know your core job. But if you're a restaurant and you're trying to get your message out there, I'd strongly recommend that you take a look at a cyber insurance policy that has media liability coverage in case something happens. There's some type of liability. Um, one of the one of the you know uh, I want to say it's a common type of claim, but I must have got six of them in last year at least was ADA claims. So folks going to click on your website and then saying that it was not compliant for the uh, uh, the blind, the deaf, something of that nature, and you then have to change your website. And effectively, you know, you have to then pay an attorney to help defend the costs, and it becomes really a nuisance type claim. Oftentimes, settle under twenty five, thirty five thousand dollars, which is oftentimes right around the deductible for certain businesses. So again, it becomes a business decision on do you want to fight it or do you want to pay or do you want to go through an insurance? And these are all decisions you know, that businesses really need to be cognizant about prior to any type of incident, right? So having the conversation, I think is really what I would be encouraging the folks on this call to, uh, to be doing. Whether you decide to act on it or not, that's a business decision. But I think that you need to at least be able to identify it, have your eyes wide open, and then you can make informed decisions on a go forward basis about what technology you wanna deploy because you're not gonna be able to do everything this year, right? But you can do encryption this year. You can do MFA next year. You can do MDR the following year. And I'm sure there'll be four other technologies after right. three years of uh, additional development. Right. Okay, thank you. You know, I'm sitting here listening and I think at this point, everyone from the guy with the hot dog stand to multi-location restaurants or to, you know, nationwide um, knows that hacking is a problem. Are there really simple steps? I mean, something just came to mind. Alan mentioned passwords, all right? How long, how often should you switch a password? Does anybody bother to change those passwords the day that you fire somebody? Well. I mean, to me, all of a sudden, there it, you fire somebody, or you're arguing with somebody, he gets fired, he grabs his stuff, he leaves. To me, that might be, an, to somebody that might be an argument, to me, that's a ticking time bomb. Larry, you, actually, you hit the nail on the head. If you look in any kind of cybersecurity frameworks, that is like one of the key questions that's asked is, is there a process for uh, managing user accounts uh, and terminating their accounts or locking them out within a uh, you know, narrow time period. Uh, in, in our practice, that's one of the things that we, we, we stress and core, a core stress is when we start working with new clients is like one of the first things we do is say, we need an onboarding 
and more importantly, an offboarding process. Because what happens is the average user, pro average staff member probably has between 20 and 30 passwords or systems that they log into and they're disparate. So they have, they have all these different places that they're putting passwords in that they're logging into, uh, they're not protected. And any one of them, and, and actually the biggest danger, and, and this is a kind of a uh, kind of an older thing, but it's one that's still valid, is people reuse passwords. Um, they, they reuse, user, it was most, almost everyone has the same username, which is generally your email, and then you have one password you're using that may or may not be complex or long. So let's say they're using like a word or a dictionary word. And what happens is people just get, you know, systems just get kind of ha hammered on it's called dictionary attacks. So what happens is people just never, never use it, never change their passwords. Now you have 20 systems that have the same password. And now the attackers into like all of your systems because one staff member who, who had a weak password or uh, you terminated but didn't, uh, didn't, didn't deactivate their account, they're now floating around and doing what's called reconnaissance. Which is which is the perhaps like a pre step before an attack, um, and some of the reconnaissance where it ends was they might get what they need from that, but um, generally speaking, you know, the, the, this is I think the other really important thing is this is not people in their basement, kind of like seeing doing it for laughs. This is criminal enterprise, professional people that are equally if not better than many of the IT professionals here in the states or you know wherever they're located, and this is their business. They're they're the, the best way to think of them is like you know, 17th century privateers, they're state sponsored and allowed to go do this as long as they don't attack the state they're in and they, they keep their share of the money uh, of their of their bounty. So it's it's like piracy is functionally what it is. Uh, state okay. sanctioned piracy. Thanks, thanks. I'm gonna go back to Bob because I see his hand up. Oh no, that's left over. But that uh, George just did answer one of the questions from uh, an audience person, uh, which was who who are these people? Are they individuals or are they state actors? And I think the explanation of uh, piracy is is uh, <clears throat> is right on. Uh, I'm also getting from you, George, that uh, I maybe should change my password from log me in on every single account I have to something I, different. I think I think uh, my, my recommendation is uh, for everyone to uh, start with a password manager. It's a safer way of handling it because it's longer passwords. You tend to be more complex and a multi-factor everything you possibly can. It's a pain and it's a pain to start. But once you get used to it, you get really used to it. There's some really great, you know, uh, be it uh, Google Authenticator. Uh, there's a Microsoft Azure one, um, LastPass, Duo. There's tons out there. They're very, they're free. Um, most systems have it at this point. But if, if I had to say, if I had to give one piece of advice, make sure that the multi-factor is on for your primary email account that has a lot of that's how you reset passwords that's how you do it but um as mark alluded earlier the threats are more sophisticated now so it's not that's not the only thing you can do um there's a lot there's a lot it's, it's escalating but um if you haven't done that step yet highly recommend that especially for the business owners for your primary accounts it was your account is the master or admin account george do you have a list made up of 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 simple steps that people could do. Sure, I could send it out to you, everyone. All right, yeah, yeah. So you know, George will. Uh, I will. Anybody that's interested in getting that list from George, please contact either Bob or myself, and uh, we will uh, put you through to George uh, to get this information. Does Does Marsh have things like that also? We We've created something called our Cyber Resiliency Network. Um, effectively, we've partnered with uh, three forensic firms that are willing to provide vulnerability scans for any insured, um, as well as uh, two law firms that are willing to do a privacy assessment, uh, determine what uh, regulations you may be subject to from a regulatory perspective. Um, so if anyone, Larry, um, would like to take advantage of that, um, feel free to reach out to Larry and Larry could uh, touch base with me and I'm happy to, you know, make that connection. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Fred. Yeah, how, I guess my first question is, how do you budget for this? Where, where does it fit? Is it based on, on the size of your revenue? How do you, how do you even build, how do you build this out even? So I, I, I well, well, you, well, you've just, you and you and Alon have just opened places up. Did you put the, is Fred just brings up a point. Have you put in a budget opening these places up for cybersecurity? Or are you just assuming that it's done like gravy? It just happens. It's not that it just happens. <laughs> I, I have 
the is a valuable exercise and it's not going to break the bank. I mean, Mark can advise on this. If, if I have one business that does 56 million and another business that does 1.5 or two, the range of cyber liability for those two, which I've paid has been between 3,500 and like 10 grand a year. Never. I mean, it's not a crazy outrageous expense. Um, I had one quick chime in, which was, you know, Alana, if you don't do any of these bad practices, then this is only on me. But like to the conversation that we've been having, I wrote this down, you know, our MailChimp account, that password is shared on multiple people, our Resi and OpenTable accounts, all the hostesses know the access and logins to those, the uh, vendor accounts, um, like a third party vendor, whether it's like Cisco or US Foods or Samtel or whatever it is, those are all login accounts that a chef and all of their sous chefs and culinary managers share. Our music systems is, a, is an app that everybody's got log on to. Um, so like from a small business perspective, those are examples of, of areas of weakness because if one chef gets really pissed off or sorry, gets really ticked off and leaves the business and is a very upset person and irrational, he may log in and like send you 60 cases of carrots the next day or, you know, whatever it is. But I think all examples within F and B. Um, I know we've been talking about the big scale and millions of dollars, but like those small things really impact us. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. it, it, they can make the difference between a profitable month and a non-profitable month for us. Correct. The margin. Hit your margin. So what do you what do you as restaurateurs do to assure that that's not going to happen to you? Well, we uh, log on. We, we logged on to this um, pod, to the <laughs> panel today, right. so that we can get off. We can start working. Um, you know, I think I, I think we've just taken for granted that like we pay a lot of money for insurance, you know, and that insurance is kind of like the thing that just covers us in case something wrong happens. But um, but the, the the question is I, is I think we're definitely not prepared as an industry. Um, we're worried every day about whether or not the carrots are coming in the back door and who's calling out and uh, how many cancellations we've had or are we too too many bookings and and those are the things that we spend all of our time you know really thinking about mm -hmm. um, and really cybersecurity has never been on that front burner for us. Mm -hmm. right. You know, coming from an insurance background, um, insurance is something that you want to be a waste of money. All right. It, you really, really want it to be, ugh, I paid all this money and I never had a claim. All right. That's what every, that's what insurance should be. It should not be something that you count on all the time to bail you out because bailing you out, putting, putting yourself in there. So can we talk or what have you heard that are really, really simple steps to better cybersecurity? George, you want to start with this? Sure. I, I, as, as I said earlier, the, the first and most important thing is, your, is managing your identities. Uh, by identity management being like, as, as this what Will and Alan was saying, about all the different logons you have, segmented logons, everyone never should never share logons because what happens then, there's no accountability for who did the action, right? If someone had a shared logon to your Twitter account and sent out, a, a, you know, an off color tweet, that would be that, that would be your responsibility because you wouldn't know who did it. Now, not that you want to do with the bond or afterwards, but it's as much safer if you have a, a segmented identity for everyone. Second thing, multi-factor across the board for for every single um, account you can possibly do. I know all the social media accounts, Mailchimp, those absolutely have multi-factor built into them. Um, work with work with the provider if you have, if you don't have any, if you have any questions, let me know. I mean, it's pretty straightforward stuff to set up. Um, from there, I really strongly recommend having um, a process and a policies around patching. Uh, th and these are and these are basic level things, but by patching your systems regularly, uh, it can really make a difference. And it could be uh, I know with Toast or other point of sale systems that may use iPads or tablets, people tend to like, oh, skip over those those updates. And sometimes those are where you have problems. Uh, we think it's an embedded device. It doesn't need to be updated, but they're, de they're definitely vulnerable. Um, 
from there, a lot of it too is the other thing I'd highly recommend. It sounds uh, is some basic training for the staff about cybersecurity. Explain to them what what how passwords work, how uh, how how multi-factor works, and email phishing attacks work. Those are the three main vectors of attack that I think small medium businesses have to really keep focusing on. They've been the same for years, and unfortunately, I feel like we're not making headway against it because. It's people just don't, I don't think, I don't know, Mark, what do you think? Is it the seriousness of it or is it just the complexity? It's frequency and severity. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. It just, so I mean, if I, if I say top three things you should do today, like when you're leaving is just focus on those three things. I mean, Mark, is there anything else you'd want to add to that? Those three? I, I think, you know, listen, I mean, we could, we can, you know, Go make deep. It, yeah, I mean, you can make it, but I think from a high level, I mean, I, I would right. just say also policies and procedures, right? So just true. making sure you have the right documentation, uh, the right templates in place, um, just in case there is an event, you know, the regulators come in, you want to make sure that you have the right documents. Right. It's, uh, you know, uh, a, 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 a business continuity and incident response plan written out, even if it's on a napkin, is better than nothing. Because, and I think people tend to find, they see templates online and they're like multi-pages and they're really complex. Just start with simple things like, you know, one, and a really great thing that, that we find with our clients works really well is we do what's called a tabletop exercise where we literally just sit with them for an hour and walk through like, what systems do you have? What works? How do you guys work? What happens here? And you start just writing down all the things. And in the end of that hour, you'll find that you'll have the things that really matter to you, things that you can live without. And that's just a great place to start as as a, as as a, as a, as an exercise. So uh, we always recommend that. I mean, uh, doing a full blown IR or uh, incident response or business continuity plan is complex and may not have time for it. But start with just start with the, with the tabletop, sort of thing. So, restaurant tours. What are you doing right now with your staffs to ensure uh, security on your on your on your uh, systems? Well, we. Um... We definitely, if we're going to be terminating an employee, we, you know, have a people and culture director with pomegranate and we are organized and set it up in a way in which we, you know, uh, log, lock them out of their accounts um, prior. Everything is done through our, um, through a Google business account. And so we can uh, lock them out of that. Uh, and that's essentially, you know, we have passwords and we have a couple of, you know, keys in the drawer. And I think that's pretty much about it. Will? <laughs> I mean, on our side, we, we've expanded, you know, we've, we've confirmed with our insurance company and we've, we've um, had discussions about what we can do to be better. And a few examples. So we started issuing all the computers that the managers are using to log into. So any like saved password or anything like that is on a company owned PC as opposed to an individual, which has better. Um, Having some tech has better um, uh, security and, and infrastructure than you know, bought at a store. Um, we change passwords, just like Alon said, you know, when, when a manager is no longer with the company, we, we get rid of their, their Google suite, uh, account. We do send that data to another manager that's on site. Um, and what we've done with purchasing is we've put into our, our standard, um, our standard account signup form for any new vendors that there must be unique accounts for each manager that does any purchasing from, uh, should that manager leave the organization. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Fred, what are you hearing out there with this? Oh, I think it, it began uh, two years ago with uh, third party data security as, as um, Uber Eats and as Grubhub began to grow. That was really the first time that it ended up on the agenda of most restaurateurs when they found out that they didn't have access to the data to their own data and that the delivery companies were gonna to try to control that data and then do whatever they wanted to do with it. And then that has now evolved into a ransomware issue, et cetera. Um, the ransomware issue is a much more difficult and complex issue. So the answer is, I think somehow it still lies low on most people's priorities until they get hacked, et cetera. But I think one of the real issues now is uh, 
now that somebody released where all the restaurant revitalization grant money went, I think the industry has now become a target and a sitting duck, given the five and $10 million uh, amounts of money that many of these restaurateurs have put in their bank accounts over the last 30 days. So I think we're in a, you better do something about it right now, issue, et cetera, to protect these new assets. So we, we've talked about hacks and, and steps we take and, uh, and, and, and the thing of redundant systems came up over and over and over. Okay. I have my own, I have one restaurant. What redundant systems are we talking about? Are we talking about going back to paper from the from the from the floor to the kitchen? What are the redundant systems we're talking about, and what do they cost? I'd say for a lot of for a lot of small medium restaurants, uh, one of the things that we've seen is that uh, people don't have two internet connections. Like it sounds like a like a thing that's silly, but people don't have two connections and and rely on these systems to, to connect. Well, so we, let me let me. I want to expand on that, George. Sure. So we talk about you see, you'll go into a restaurant, and some restaurants have one for the kitchen, one for the POS, one for the register, one for uh, incoming. Uh, excuse me, one for the the guests. Right. You're talking about redundant systems. How many systems should there be in an average restaurant? How, how does this work out? How do we protect these things? Because now we're talking, we, Wi-Fi used to be, somebody calls you up on the phone, sure. says, I want this, you write it on a piece of paper, you run it into the kitchen. What are we talking about now? So, so I'd say, I mean, it starts- It sounds with, like, by the yeah. way, George, it sounds like all, all of these systems can be irradiating, irradiating, irradi uh, you know, so, Radiating. Radio waves going through us and the food. Yeah, right. that's true. We are, we, we are, we have, we definitely have a lot of low energy radio going through us compared to the past. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's definitely true. But I'd say um, for most restaurants, most restaurants usually want to have two discrete uh, internet connections, and then you want to use a fairly high quality wi uh, wireless system that can segment logically based on need, like kitchen system, uh, p things for pieces that are PCI compliant. Uh, guest access. Uh, we see a lot of times. It sounds funny, but uh, music systems can dam it can cause disruption in the network, uh, just because the way they tend to tend to work. Um, you know, I think in a small so a small place, a, sm a small operation, you're not going to get a lot of redundancy past those connectivity redundancies, because you're relying on third party systems. And I think the the more important thing to do is that if those systems aren't available, uh, be it internet or or whatever that you do have a, a redundancy plan for them, like and it may, and it may be paper back, going back to paper, but ha, but do it in advance with the staff. Besides trying to do it in the day of, that's the, I mean we see the biggest problem we see is that people are trying to do it on the fly, and you, now you're just now it's just chaos, right? You just no one knows how to do it. It'd be better to take a two hours to say okay we're gonna you know man a lunch service or like a Tuesday when the restaurant's not really busy. Let's try it out or do it and do it in pre-flight because if you have it beforehand, um, that that can make a real difference between having a somewhat successful service, at least keeping operational, versus having to shut down. So I want to chat. Can I, Larry? Can I chime in? Sure. On that one? Sure. Um, and Alana, I'm really interested in your feedback on this one too. So um, our higher grossing volume. You so a restaurant that does anything over five million bucks, um, we're very specific about what we put into these. So we have three, uh, we have three static IPs. Right. So one is one router, three static IPs. One of them mm -hmm. goes to a Rocky Hub, which supports sure. our POS infrastructure. Yeah, it, right? mm -hmm. and it gives you that that additional firewall of of access point to point of sale for PCI compliance. Sure. We've goes to the whole camera system of the of the operation, and then one that heads to Wi-Fi. Uh, mm -hmm. for, for guest use within the right. business. And then separate from that, as anybody that's in New York City knows, New York City internet's garbage. So <laughs> yes. we have an alternative provider backup Correct. Jack, to our Meraki system only, mm -hmm. which if the internet goes down, the Meraki then goes to the backup uh, internet provider so that we can still have credit card transactions and we don't lose our 
ability to function as a business. Sure. Yeah, that's that's a great. That's, that's, we recommend usually we have a slightly different design, but very similar to that. The other thing I'd recommend uh, for not super high cost is a 4G or 5G backup. So in case there's a cable cut or something like that, you can still process credit cards, get on a busy cellular network. Um, those are pretty, those are a great way to ensure that the operation stays up and running. But if you have a 5G or 4G networks down, we have a bigger problem, generally speaking. Okay. Um, life has gotten very complicated. Yes. It got very complicated. And, and the one thing that you have to look to uh, to keep your business less complicated is the experts. And I think we've brought you some people today that were able to talk to issues that can affect food service. You know, I remember back to my first experience in a restaurant when I was working at, as a little child at my grandmother's hotel upstate New York. And grandma used to have about 40, 50 people in the dining room and the waiters are taking orders and the waiters would come in and shout the orders to my grandmother who would remember all of them <laughs> and get every meal out exactly you know mrs mrs uh, garfield always got the extra gravy on her potatoes and everything went on perfectly well life is a little bit more complicated now we've got indoor eating we've got outdoor eating we've got orders coming in we've got catering coming in for orders next week all on the same systems so please please you know listen to what people have said here and, and and take care. So what I'd like to do in the next five minutes or so is go around the room and the one takeaway that you would give people now uh, that they should maybe jot something down so that you can help them later on. Uh, George, why don't you start? So uh, I guess my, my one, t I, I, I will say probably one takeaway is, is spend the time to, to, to work with your managers and your team to put together the things that are critical to your business, do a, a, a basic a, a basic impact analysis, because that will help you really identify the things you got to put your energies towards. Uh, and that could be some basics like passwords, that sort of thing. But really, kind of get that meta a kind of meta level of things you you should know about in your business, and that will really help you kind of identify it and 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 find the, the vulnerabilities and weak spots. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, so I would say. Um, you know, think about uh, think about this from a proactive standpoint. Think about the policies and procedures and the technology that you can deploy. Determine what you feel that your exposure may be. Speak to your insurance broker. Determine if cyber insurance is appropriate, and then know that there is no standardization within the cyber insurance marketplace. So determine where you feel that your exposures might be, or ask your broker where your exposures might be, and then customize the policy because these policies are highly customizable more so than auto or general liability or workers comp or et cetera. Um, so these, you, you need to ask for it and then the marketplace may be able to give it rather than just taking what the marketplace is giving at, at first glance. And, and I wanna add something to that. Like I, um, it's do not buy what you want, <laughs> buy what you need. Half the time, I mean, you don't need the extra whistles and buzzers that you that, but there are things that you need that you have no idea that you need, and you have to go to someone you trust. You know, I see this commercial on TV for car insurance: buy only what you need. Well, twenty forty coverage on your car is not what you need. You need a lot more that you can get away with it in certain states but it's not what you need. Listen to your broker because you want the insurance that you buy to actually cover your needs. All right, Alan. I would say uh, don't take for granted that your insurance company and third party providers will have everything you need in place um, when something wrong does happen. Um, I think mostly intellectual property and also just um, messaging that's going out to the world. As, as we all know, it, it only takes one thing to go viral for it to have huge impacts on your business. And, uh, and it may not come from you. And that's uh, very concerning. So um, I feel like I got 
uh, really scared during this panel, <laughs> which which uh, is probably a we've good thing. done our jobs. We always say, <laughs> you, know, you can always be a little scared going into uh, an opening or a service, and uh, this is uh, no different. All right, thank you, thank you, William. Uh, I wrote down four notes. I said limit exposure, stay in restaurants, uh, call George and Mark before thinking about anything e-commerce. <laughs> 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 Fred. Fred. This, was, this was amazing. Absolutely amazing. And and, and I think the uh, the takeaway is there's expertise out there. You need to get it. And even if it starts with something as simple as calling one of you guys to figure out how to change and manage passwords immediately, then that's a great first step. Do it. Okay. Bob? Uh, restaurants have come an awful long way since the, uh, the, the, the scratch the pad and with the carbon, uh, the carbon copy technology has made, uh, the restaurant business new, exciting and, uh, and, and ideally more profitable. Uh, the technology with the POS systems and so forth, all, all that stuff is, is truly unbelievable. However, it comes at a cost and the cost is not only just the cost of the software and the, and the hardware that's necessary, but it's also in the cost of protection. Um, a lot of small businesses may look at that as a uh, as prohibitive or, or a pain or, or something they, they may regard themselves as getting ripped off uh, by the insurance companies or, or the, the, the software companies. The, um, the procedures may seem a little bit uh, onerous. However, uh, that is the cost of doing business. And hopefully that uh, those costs uh, are well, it's well worth those costs for the, for the increase in profitability, efficiency, and productivity that, uh, that results from all the new technology. So, uh, so I think what I got out of it is that uh, small businesses need to uh, put it in as a budget, need to invest, and need to be as serious about it as, as uh, you know, the major, the major chains are. Okay. You know, I, I, Alon spurred something in my head, put a spark in my head, and, it, and it's something that, that we're all, all guilty of. Um, he said the insurance company, it, it does not have everything you need in an emergency. Usually, that's because you bought a policy five years ago or you've bought you you've set up a system five years ago and you've been paying for the same system or the same insurance policy for five years the same what's changed in five years the whole world everything the whole world we Everything. buy these things stick them in a drawer and we get a quarterly bill or a or a annual bill we pay them and go i'm safe no, you're not. No, you're not. The reason why George and and people like George and Mark and the, the, the thousands of other people in this area that do these things are in existence is not only to sell you things, but they're there to protect you. And they can't protect you if you speak to them once a year, once every three years, once every five years. Hey, Last three years, what changed in business? Everything has changed. So does everything you do to protect yourself have to change. So I'm not selling policies. I'm not selling services. I'm just trying to give you one of these things in the head. Wake up. Whether, you, whether you're a one person operation or you've got 5,000 people working for you, your world has changed. World has changed. So change with it. And one last takeaway. Uh, I don't know if anybody's noticed, but I got a giant Band-Aid on my nose. Uh, that's because I went, po went against everything that's ever been taught to me as a kid. I spent four years as a lifeguard on the beach. I spent 35 years, 35 years actively playing soccer. Never did you see zinc oxide or sunblock on me? Because I was a golden god. <laughs> I was a golden god. I looked it a long great. time ago. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So I have two questions. One yeah. is, uh, 
why don't you have a Flintstones Band-Aid on instead of that flesh colored one? Yes, yes, I ran out of them. I ran out of them. Listen. And secondly, based on that analogy, did you actually get a COVID vaccine or not? Yes, I did. (laughs) Yes, I did. (laughs) Yes, I did. But listen to them. Sunscreen is important. Sunscreen is important. I mean, I'm only going out for an hour in the sun. When we were kid, when we were teenagers, people put olive oil all over themselves to enhance the sun. We were actually frying ourselves, and many of us, Bob included, have piece. We've left pieces on the dermatologist floor because Bob has a similar background to me as a lifeguard and such. So listen to these experts, listen to experts. They're experts for a reason. So listen, besides wearing sunscreen, I only have two takeaways. Stay positive, test negative, and hope to see you all in two weeks. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank we you. appreciate Thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you Larry, you have golden god, you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> Bye now. Have a good day, everybody. Bye.